The subject of my uh, uh, presentation is uh, Miss Goop and the question of modernity. I think there's something ironic in the fact that we're having a conference on Shah Rukh and Miss Goop, uh, whose dedication to uh, the Persian language, to making it more precise, more pithy, more poetic, more prevalent, uh, was one of the singular uh, aspects of his uh, life and his accomplishments. Uh, and yet the conference, uh, the primary language of the conference is English. Uh, the purpose is, I think, twofold. Uh, one is that uh, we want to uh, introduce this singular uh, Iranian intellectual to a much wider audience and celebrate the collection that uh, is now at Stanford, the collection of his papers. And thus we chose uh, a bilingual conference. And uh, I hope that uh, uh, Mr. Miskoop uh, will not be unhappy with the fact that I'm speaking in English. Um, I think there is uh, something of an agreement that the central problematic of uh, modern Iranian history, certainly intellectual history, but I would suggest uh, political history, economic history, uh, history of ideas, uh, cultural history, has been the question of modernity. Uh, what is modernity? Uh, where is it rooted? Is it a Western phenomena? Is it desirable? If it is desirable, how do we uh, implement it? What do we do with tradition? What part of a tradition do we um, embrace? What part of it do we reject? Uh, in a sense, um, much of uh, intellectual discourse in Iran in the last uh, century and a half, uh, and, and I would even suggest that maybe much earlier, because in some of uh, my writings, I've argued that actually the debate in, about modernity in Iran uh, begins very much uh, uh, earlier than what it did in the West, in terms of its chronology, that at the time of uh, Ferdowsis of Iran, the Behabis of Iran, the Nizamis, uh, the Sa'dis, the Pirunis, the Razis, uh, which all belong to uh, a golden age of uh, uh, budding enlightenment in Iran. Uh, that's where the initial debate begins. But leaving that aside, and Ms. Kub does go back to that source often for his own modernity, uh, the question in the last 150 years has been uh, an, uh, the question that, in a sense, Montesquieu asked in his Persian letters, where he said, uh, how can you be Persian and modern at the same time? Uh, Montesquieu's understanding of what Persianness meant was deeply imbued with Orientalist uh, stereotypes. But the question, I think, is a valid question. It's still a question that we need to answer. How can we be modern and uh, Persian? And Mescou, I think, has a life dedicated to this question. Uh, I think if you look at this rather remarkable array of works that he has left behind, whether his published works or whether some of the notes that uh, are now available at Stanford in this very rich archive that he has left behind, or the letters that he has very uh, diligently uh, kept. Uh, Professor Kam Shah has helped uh, preserve and then transfer to Stanford. And we are very grateful for that. Uh, I think there is uh, one running theme from the earliest period of his intellectual life to his last dying days. And that's the question of how can you be modern and Persian at the same time? Uh, regardless of what genre he wrote in, and he wrote in many genres, from essays to uh, uh, memoirs, <clears throat> from pseudonymous, pseudonymously published uh, critique of Islam uh, to lectures about Shah Nameh in diaspora. Uh, what connects these multidisciplinary, multi-genre uh, collection of works, uh, or over as uh, our French speakers would love to, uh, would call it, uh, is the question of, again, modernity. And this goes back to his earliest uh, uh, intellectual trajectory as well. Uh, when I was reading uh, 
Professor Kamshad's Hadith and Nafs, and he was describing his first encounters with Maskub. Uh, you see a rather remarkable uh, anecdote there. Uh, uh, both Kamshad and Maskub are uh, the ones who write good and Shah, good composition for the high schools. Uh, but one day, uh, as they begin the friendship, the lifelong friendship, uh, Maskub tells uh, Kamshad, why do you write this style? Uh, why do you read this kind of a uh, La Martin, this kind of romantic pop French uh, that are essentially very different from good Persian prose? And uh, he suggests um, that he should begin to read Behaqli and then gives him a series of other books to read so that his uh, prose becomes more, uh, in a way, uh, Persian. Uh, from that early anecdote to everything else, this is part of, I think, his uh, essential uh, problematic, the problematic that defines this rich, multifaceted, multi-genre uh, collection of works. Uh, and one of the reasons I think that he's become uh, more acclaimed today than he ever was during his life, and one of the reasons that I think he might in the future uh, be even more acclaimed, uh, is that uh, in some ways he is not only an embodiment of a remarkable uh, paradigmatic change that is happening in the domain of modernity in Iran, uh, but that in the three kinds of paradigms, different paradigms that Iranian society has faced with, is, is, uh, uh, and I will briefly discuss each of them, uh, Meskoub has traveled in that path, Maskub has an, at one time been part of that paradigm, uh, but he has then uh, moved on and has uh, in each phase uh, picked his own path and has gone the, uh, what Frost would call the road less traveled. And we are fortunate for him having gone these three paradigms and having uh, gone through these paradigms and having chosen the road less traveled. Uh, the three paradigms uh, that I think capture his life, the intellectual trajectory of his life, and I think the most important intellectual trajectory of modern Iran, uh, these are not uh, exhausted in terms of the paradigms of modernity that have been around, but I think they are the three most important, most influential. The first one is uh, uh, what, to use his own word, uh, is the Leninist-Stalinist paradigm. Uh, as uh, we know, uh, Marxism uh, is clearly a child of modernity. It's a child of its rationalism. Uh, and once that rationalism comes about, uh, once that rationalism, in a sense, captures the imagination in France of the uh, French revolutionaries, uh, you have two iterations uh, of uh, political modernity, if you will. Uh, and many different scholars have written about this eloquently. Uh, the, the two different iterations are, for lack of, again, a better word, uh, to use a label that other scholars have used, other philosophers who have written about this have used. Um, it, one is a, a tradition that goes back to Robespierre, the reign of terror, that sees an elite to embody the popular will and sees an elite enlightened. Uh, and because of this enlightened or claimed enlightenment, uh, then claiming the right to push society towards modernity by any means possible. Lenin famously said it, I will take Russia to the paradise in chain if need be. Uh, so there is a Robespierre tradition of uh, uh, political modernity, and there is a Danton tradition of uh, modernity. Danton was another character of the French Revolution who lost his life and basically said uh, no elite has the right to usurp the authority to speak for the masses. We should allow the pub, uh, general will, what Rousseau called the general will, uh, to speak for itself. Uh, so we cannot usurp the right to represent others. From the Danton tradition, you get the development of liberal democracy, you get the development of even, even in a sense, uh, 
social democracy. Uh, Mescoub begins his life uh, very much in the tradition uh, of uh, the uh, Robespierre uh, uh, iteration of political modernity by becoming a member of it to the party. Uh, and then uh, he, once he leaves that paradigm, he decides to uh, offer a very interesting, different reading of his own experience, as I'll try to explain. Uh, in other words, his membership in the Tudor party and his eventual departure from the Tudor party is again very unusual and uh, puts him in a very rare company of people who have traveled this and not fallen into uh, crass anti communism. Uh, the second paradigm uh, that has been prevalent in modern Iran uh, is the paradigm of people uh, like, for example, Furuhi, like Golestan, like Minavi, like Shatman, uh, who are uh, very erudite intellectuals, uh, uh, but did not think that rejecting authority, particularly the authority of the Pahlavi regime, is a precondition of transitioning to modernity or even a precondition of being an intellectual. They worked within the Pahlavi structure, maintaining different levels of distance from it, maintaining different levels of criticism of it, but nevertheless insisting that within this framework they can achieve uh, best uh, their goal of a modern polity in Iran. Mescoup, after leaving the party, for uh, virtually the entire time he lived in Iran, uh, was a member of this paradigm. And there too, as I will try to explain briefly, uh, he did it differently. Uh, unlike, for example, Furuhi, unlike, for example, uh, some members of this paradigm, uh, uh, he did not simply uh, focus on uh, uh, finding and reading and rereading some of the classics of Persian uh, literature and Persian poetry to help bring about this modernity. In other words, even in that period, his modernity is unmistakably Persian, unmistakably based on everything from Shah Naumeh and Beihaqi to Hafiz to uh, the Constitutional Revolution, the Age of Awakening that he talks about in his books. Uh, but at the same time, uh, he was invariably then always curious about the world. Uh, his modernity was global and local. His modernity was in a true sense of the word, uh, what uh, uh, Mignolo calls uh, the modernity of a decolonized intellectual. Uh, he was never enamored so much of the West to think that Iran has to become completely Western. Uh, he was never enamored of Iran's tradition, so that he would say all Iran has to do is go back to his tradition. Uh, he was critical of aspects of the West, but omnivoriously curious about all that was happening in the West, whether it was in museum, whether it was in uh, literature, whether it was music. Uh, so global and local. Uh, was in that second phase, that second paradigm, the way he uh, approached modernity. Uh, the third uh, paradigm of modernity, the third period in Iran's encounter with modernity amongst intellectuals, is the part of the Iranian intellectual that moved to diaspora by force. Uh, and uh, there too, as Kuv spent the uh, last uh, uh, two decades of his life, at least, uh, in diaspora. But uh, he, I, I think, did it his own way, as uh, uh, Frank Sinatra would say. Uh, uh, Iranians, intellectuals of diaspora, uh, had a double sense of uh, fallenness. Uh, it has been said often <clears throat> that exile is diff difficult because exiles are custodians of dead treasures. They lose their language, they lose their sense of belonging, but also in some cases, as very distinctively in Iran, uh, Iranian intellectuals had at least in their own mind 
placed themselves in a kind of Promethean perch. They were the liberators of society. They were the wise enlighteners of society. They expected respect. They expected society to afford them all due uh, comfort and respect so that they can engage in their enlightenment. And they can engage essentially uh, in their uh, messianic role. Iranian uh, Promethean intellectuals were the secular manifestation of the religious messianic tendencies so prevalent in Iran, but captured by uh, Mahdism, Imam Zaman, and everything else. Iranian intellectuals were essentially the secular versions of this. But when the revolution came, Iranian secular intellectuals were now faced with a new category of people, a regime that literally claimed itself to be representative of that Messiah, mullahs who claimed to be literally in contact with that Messiah and representing that Messiah. So uh, they lost that sense of entitled uh, Promethean identity or self-declared Promethean identity, and then they come to exile and they become custodians of their treasures. Their mastery of the Persian language is not for not here. Uh, so that often leads, as we can see in many writings, uh, either in isolation, uh, either in self self-loathing or social loathing or despair and despondency, mm -hmm. uh, an effort to isolate yourself from this strange new home. Uh, I'm always reminded of uh, a conversation uh, that I had with Olam uh, uh, Saudi in Paris. And uh, he said, I don't want to learn anything about French. I don't want to learn French. I don't want to uh, become part of this society. I'm a stranger here and I prefer to remain a stranger. Uh, many of the poetry that has been written is a poetry of despair. Uh, Mescoub, uh, whether he was uh, uh, doing some academic work in some of the best institutions that were available to uh, people of his expertise, or whether he was uh, making a living uh, uh, from the uh, back room of a shop, uh, Photoshop, uh, he, uh, although he clearly from his memoirs, has these moments of uh, despair, these moments of anguish, these moments of uh, uh, anxiety. Uh, but uh, as his rich collection of writings, the, the seminars that he organizes, the lectures that he gives, uh, it make clear he was always uh, continuing his primary preoccupation, understanding Iranian modernity, coming up with an answer that basically uh, says, uh, how can you be Persian and modern? And the way he consistently approaches this is that you can be Persian and modern by being first Persian, immersing yourself in your own tradition, immersing yourself in that tradition in a critical way, uh, but also uh, augmenting that uh, sort of self uh, critical cognition, self-critical gnosis with awareness of what is happening globally. And from that mixture, you can then create the identity uh, that is unmistakably Persian and unmistakably global. Uh, and as I said, in each of these, he tries to do it uh, his own way. And I, I want to focus a little bit on his experience with his first paradigm, because I think that goes to the core of uh, both his approach, uh, his method of uh, uh, analysis, uh, and also um, to um, the difference that his approach has with many others. Uh, as I said, he begins as a good comrade in the Tudor party, uh, but then he uh, begins to have doubt. Clearly, even when he is a comrade, a good comrade, one can see from some of his writings that uh, the fealty of the party to the Soviets, the despotic nature of the party hierarchy uh, are beginning to uh, um, bother him. Uh, but eventually, uh, he goes to prison and he comes out of prison very critical of the party. But the way he's critical of the party isn't a, uh, 
the kind of a criticism of negating all that has happened in that experience. He tries, as he has tried to resurrect from the Iranian history, what is redeemable, what is uh, lofty, and what is rational, and what is human, uh, humanistic. He tries to do the same thing with the to the party experience. Uh, he tries to find the best aspect of the to the party experience, and while rejecting the parts that need to be rejected, tries to embrace that. And the way he does that is by pointing to a character uh, that is very different from the traditional dogmatic uh, to the member. The orthodox history of to the party posits Ruzbe as the icon. Ms. Goop goes into that history and finds his own iteration of it in the character of Kayvan. And it is in Kayvan, who is a humanist, who is a Democrat in his approach to others, who is as much likely to be friends with the Raja Afshar as with Sadiq Hedayat, as with uh, someone like Ruzbe. In other words, he is uh, egalitarian, he is ecumenical, he is rational, he is deeply curious about the world, he's constantly writing reviews, uh, he has this uh, touch of a, a poet when it comes to his relationship with his beloved. Uh, all of these create a different iconic figure. And he places that uh, uh, character squarely in the best tradition of modernity. In this, uh, to go back to uh, two paradigms within the, the uh, Marxism, uh, within the political uh, tradition of uh, modernity, the Robespierre tradition and the Danton figure. Uh, although he himself was a part of a Robespierre party, he concocts for himself an identity. He creates for himself an identity that is more Danton-like and then says the character that we should think about as embodying the best and the uh, highest ideal of the two-day experience is actually K1, it's not Ruzbe. And then he criticizes the two-day experience in a, lang in a way that is remarkable. Uh, let me read a, a passage. Um, he says, and he's talking about the two-day party, a belief in a despotic, supposedly rational, but anti-rational, a view that ignored the irrational, the emotional, the instinctive, the existential, and the esoteric aspects of humanity, uh, and offers, again, I'm quoting directly, a firm hope to this worldly resurrection and arrival at this earthly paradise. The choice of every word here, as almost in everything Ms. Cook writes, is worth, uh, worthy of uh, contemplation. He is clearly positing something that he later uh, argues almost overtly in another book. Here he's talking about K1. Here he's talking about the to the party. And he says, we ignore the individual. Uh, he ends up by this uh, quote in that passage. In those days, none of us knew what value the individuality of the social human being possessed and what consequences would follow should this individualism be parlayed in the name of social progress. In no uncertain terms, then, he says, Marxism a la Ruzbe, Marxism a la today orthodoxy, is that a rationalism, is that ignoring of the individual, ignoring the esoteric individuality, very much comes close to the romantic view that modernity misses the boat because it overemphasizes the individual. He says individual is very individual is very difficult to reduce him to these uh, categories. Uh, what makes this passage, I think, remarkable is uh, when you put it in the context of his uh, remarkable book, uh, Kasravi-like critique, of Islam. Um, he wrote, like Kasravi, some of it and under pseudonym. Here he writes uh, in the, under the uh, pseudonym of uh, Mim Kuhyar, uh, the, the, the rational critique of uh, uh, Islam, uh, where he 
almost verbatim uses the same kind of uh, terminology in criticizing uh, the anti-modern, uh, anti-democratic aspects of Islamic uh, law, particularly as manifest uh, in the Iranian constitution. When you read his critique of law and justice and jurisprudence, it is in a sense a defense of modernity. He says laws should emanate from the will of the people. Divine laws cannot be the, the, the foundation of a democratic polity. The Iranian constitution as written after the revolution does not allow for a democratic interpretation because uh, it does not accept the notion of popular will. Uh, so uh, he comes very close, I think, to arguing what uh, philosophers like Berdyayev have argued, that uh, uh, in, the, in the famous book called The Origins of uh, Russian Communism, that uh, Russian communism uh, is a kind of a secular reiteration of Christian orthodoxy. Uh, so for him, for Ruzbe, uh, to the orthodoxy is a reincarnation of uh, uh, Islamic orthodoxy as understood as, and as he criticizes later. In different facets of his, uh, uh, specific facets of his uh, worldview, he's also very, I think, quintessentially modern. His approach to women is remarkable. Not only uh, in the book on Kayvan, he begins the book uh, by uh, uh, introduction by uh, uh, Puriya Sultani, ends it by introduction by Puriya Sultani. He not only criticizes, for example, Nima for lacking any attention to the role of woman, but his memoirs himself, his writings himself, are imbued with this notion that women are a central part of this modern experience, and unless we accept their role, we cannot accept their role as equal, we cannot uh, become uh, modern. Uh, the, the other aspect of uh, his uh, uh, quintessential modernity uh, is uh, his uh, willingness to speak about himself in a remarkably honest way, not just his writing, not just his memoir, but what he has left behind, the letters he has left behind, are going to give us a kind of a view of him, uh, of all his accomplishments as well as all his failures, in a way that is unlike, I think, any uh, intellectual, certainly any intellectual that comes from that uh, tradition of uh, leftist intellectualism that has a model of what an intellectual is, and uh, anything that doesn't fit that model doesn't fit in their narratives of history. The last point that I want to uh, uh, mention in this brief uh, iteration of uh, what will be a longer piece uh, is uh, his view on death. Uh, Ms. Coop has a remarkable uh, essay uh, that he wrote for Iran, Iran Name, uh, and it, it begins by uh, conjuring a stunning line from Ferdowsi, Zemadar Hamin Mag Razadeng. Uh, and he talks about death, and he talks about the fear of death in his writing. It very much rem reminds me of what has been called the tragic vision in uh, history of ideas. Secular intellectuals who have lost the faith in the other world, who have lost the faith in uh, theologies, and uh, are trying to find some meaning to life. Uh, and Meskoub says uh, in his work, his own words, uh, recognizing the eminence of death, uh, recognizing the contingency of a life, I have decided to seek my permanence in kalam, in creativity. And we are all uh, luckier for it that he insisted uh, in this tradition and indeed became, uh, I think, uh, permanent and offering a kind of a rational, self-critical, um, uh, global and local uh, answer to how one can become modern and Persian at the same time. Thank you.